is the United States heading into another Cold War, Cold War 2.0? Are we already in a Cold War? Or are we right on the threshold of a hot war? I mean, the answer to these questions are pretty significant because it has a great deal to do with your national security going forward. And there is literally no one better to talk about these things on this level, especially than Ambassador Chaz Freeman. Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador, welcome back to the show and uh, really grateful to have you on this really substantive conversation today. Thanks, Danny. Glad to be back. Uh, well, let's just kind of set the stage for for some of our viewers. Uh, most people already know this, but uh, especially just in the last like 48 hours and apparently continuing on even today, uh, there's been a lot of uh, dust up because of some comments made by French President Emmanuel Macron uh, and then the responses from Vladimir Putin, as it has a great deal to do with how this war is going on in Ukraine. And it's ironic that almost this, this disputes between these two and the commentary going on in Washington has almost superseded the war uh, taken to relegate it to secondary status, ironically. Uh, but that could that could change in a moment's notice. So first of all, let's take a look at what uh, President Macron said just last night. Qu'est-ce qui se joue en Ukraine? Une guerre qui est existentielle pour notre Europe et pour la France. J'espère qu'on y reviendra parce que c'est un sujet clé. Et donc je décide parce qu'après deux ans de guerre, après d'ailleurs, je veux ici le rappeler, que nous ayons systématiquement fait ce que nous disions que nous n'allions pas faire. Ce qui relativise aussi les propos très définitifs tenus parfois par certains à travers l'Europe. Il y a deux ans, nous disions « jamais on enverra de chars ». On l'a fait. Il y a deux ans, on disait « jamais nous n'enverrons de missiles de longue, moyenne portée ». On l'a fait. Mais... On disait « jamais on enverra d'avions ». Certains sont en train de le faire. Donc, nous avons mis trop de limites, si je puis dire, dans notre vocabulaire. Nous ne sommes pas dans l'escalade. Nous, nous ne sommes pas en guerre contre la Russie. Simplement, il faut être clair, nous ne devons pas laisser la Russie gagner. Too many limits on our vocabulary, he said. Elsewhere in that same uh, interview, he said, we're not going to give ourselves any red lines. Well, that definitely got the uh, attention of Vladimir Putin, who actually preempted that one day earlier, said this about those red lines. Well, first of all, North Korea, they have a nuclear umbrella of their own. They can't ask us for anything. Secondly, from what we see now, from what's happening on the battlefield, we are doing quite fine with the goals that we have set out for ourselves. As for those states who are saying that they have no red lines in regards of Russia, well, they need to understand that, that Russia will have no red lines in regards of these countries. Now, we had uh, Professor Mearsheimer on uh, a few days ago where he was talking about some of these things, and he, and he kind of laid out where he thought things could go, where they should go, but then he identified some problems with that path. You want to solve the Ukraine problem by creating a neutral Ukraine and doing uh, everything you can to make sure that the Russians feel assured that Ukraine and NATO uh, are not together going to present them with a serious threat moving forward. And then at the same time, I think what you try to do is improve diplomatic relations slowly but steadily with the Russians. The problem is that selling that kind of diplomatic solution in the United States at this point in time is almost impossible. People are so deeply invested in this war and so thoroughly convinced that the Russians are a mortal threat to Western Europe or to Europe more generally and to the United States that getting them to change their thinking is going to take a considerable amount of time. And what we don't have at this juncture is time. And now, he made those comments before Macron's where he says, you know, some in Europe view Russia as the mortal enemy threat. And so and if you have that mentality of threat, how do you get back to the point he was talking about of diplomacy to where you can manage these things if your mentality is that from the beginning? And it sure seems like Macron's viewing Putin as an, an, an unreliable, I mean, see, an erstwhile enemy that can't be rehabilitated. Well, I think uh, Macron has an agenda here, uh, and that is oh, the eternal agenda of the French uh, to become the uh, central uh, element in a European uh, defense system. How do you do that? Um, the same way that uh, Senator Vandenberg told uh, Harry Truman to sell NATO, that is, 
scare the hell out of the population. So you get this language about um, uh, Russia being an existential threat to Europe. Um, John Mearsheimer, I think, is correct. That is hooey. It is nonsense. Uh, but it sells well um, if you're trying to boost defense budgets and you're trying to encourage other countries in Europe to accept your leadership, uh, which is what Mr. Macron is trying to do. You know, I think we are living in the world, to go back to your original question on this show, uh, Danny, we are living in the world that was created by the Cold War. Um, many elements of the changes that we undertook in that war live on. Uh, we have, as, as President Eisenhower warned, a military industrial complex that is enormously powerful and guides our, both our foreign policy and in many respects, our economy. Uh, we are building national debt at an alarming rate through what can only be called military Keynesianism, that is increasing the defense budget, which next year is due to go well, to about a trillion dollars, not including the additional 40% that isn't in the defense budget, but which is spent on our, on our military and defense. Um, we have a military mindset. Uh, the Cold War began with a diplomatic strategy called containment. By the end of the Cold War, that had become a military strategy. The Cold War left us with 700, 800 bases all over the world and with defense commitments to protect virtually everybody. And it was followed by a moment of triumphalism in which we advanced our sphere of influence in Europe steadily to the borders of Russia, which alarmed Russia, which warned us consistently as we did that, that it would be forced to react and which has reacted. Uh, so uh, I think in many ways we live in a world that the Cold War is shaped. But as you said at the outset, or suggested, there's no reason to believe that uh, if this war in Ukraine spreads, or if we get into a war with China, that it's going to be a cold war. It could yeah. very well be the hottest of hot wars. And and so let me ask you, because your, your diplomatic and, and uh, government career crossed over the cold war into the post-cold war world. So you, you've had a front row seat for a lot of that. Uh, going back decades even and, and into the, the new post-war war period. So there's really nobody better who viewed it firsthand to be able to talk, uh, you know, see how it happened. And I'm just wondering from your perspective uh, how you made that transition because there there are many in the U.S. government today, especially that cut their teeth in the Cold War as well, but they never left any of that behind and they maintained that same Russia is the per permanent enemy mentality and the, the conditions on the ground haven't seemed to have any effect on that, but you did have a transition. I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about your experiences in the height of the Cold War and then as it transitioned out. I was uh, very much uh, actively involved in our side of the Cold War. I was committed to it. I worked in many fields uh, in support of it, including uh, propaganda. I had two tours with the U.S. Information Agency one in India and one in Washington. Um, I, 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 I believed uh, in the righteousness of our cause, but I would point to a number of things that were quite peculiar about the Cold War. The first is, it's very rare for uh, strategic imperatives or geopolitics, if you will, to coincide with ideology. And yet our contest with the Soviet Union was one that combined geopolitics with ideology. We seem to have forgotten the difference. So we assume that unless our ideology prevails everywhere, whatever our ideology is, we say it's democracy, uh, that we are somehow endangered geopolitically. I think that's a totally false equation, but it's one that has captured us. Second, when the Cold War ended, uh, we began to suffer, most of us, from what I call enemy deprivation syndrome, which is the sick feeling you get when your enemy irresponsibly drops dead on you and you don't know which way to point your ammunition, your guns. Uh, I don't think I had that. Um, I saw in Russia a country after the end of the Cold War that was desperate to redefine itself and develop a, a relationship with the West, incorporate itself 
into the West and that was instead treated, as you suggested, as though it were still the Soviet Union and uh, and and an enemy. Now, why is it? Mr. Ambassador, remind me what year you started your government service? 1965. 1965. Okay, so this and, will cross over. That was, I had gone through the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis as a student at Yale, and um, uh, I joined the Foreign Service from the Harvard Law School, um, and uh, I was very committed at that time to opening to China to balance the Soviet Union, which was um, on the on the on the make. It appeared, uh, so uh, I was very committed to all that. So, so you to- were you were actually uh, someone who was at the time of of this clip I'm about to show. So, what if you could talk a little bit about how you mentally processed the issues about the Cuban Missile Crisis and the how close that came to you know, the destruction of everything. And this comment uh, a little bit earlier by President Eisenhower. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. Now, this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. Now, there hadn't been a whole lot of the, the, certainly not like it is now where it's pervasive and it's got its tentacles all throughout (laughs) every element of of elected officials at the national level. But when you heard that at the time, and and you're also seeing, yeah, but we need the military industrial complex so that we can maintain the Cold War, the military balance. How did those things strike you then? And how did you see that change over time? Well, of course, Eisenhower was prescient. He was predicting what would happen unless we pulled ourselves up a bit. Um, one of the reasons that he advocated um, the, the reliance on a nuclear deterrent uh, was to limit defense spending. Uh, more bang for the buck, he thought. <clears throat> but the fact is that um, everything he predicted has come true. His original draft, by the way, was military industrial congressional complex. You could now add intelligence community to that. We have a national security state, which we have brought into being. A great part of our industrial production is now devoted to the military. We are the largest arms exporter by a wide margin. And um, that, you know, despite the fact we run a huge trade deficit, uh, that offsets it. Um, so we become very dependent on the military industrial complex with all of the consequences that he foresaw. One thing fundamental that changed was when the Vietnam War became so intensely unpopular um, and did such damage to the US armed forces, Richard Nixon decided that he would prefer to have a voluntary, a volunteer force which would separate the military from public opinion. If you don't have the draft, then the average American doesn't have any connection to the fighting abroad. And if you remember when George W. Bush foolishly invaded Iraq and he was asked what Americans should do to support that. He said, go shopping. Shop till you drop. Yeah. Um, So... Um, the fact that we know. Wait, wait, wait. So, so you're saying that 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 move by by Nixon was a, a calculated political move 
to, to dis say, disconnect that? <clears throat> Absolutely. To preclude further that. popular uh, intervention, opposition to foreign policy adventurism of the sort he felt wow. he was entitled to conduct. That was, and that is how it has worked. Um, we have a very professional military, which is quite separate from the public at large. Um, much admired, um, but much in the same way that uh, fans in a football stadium admire their team. Um, they don't get hurt. They don't get banged up. They don't do anything but applaud right. or groan when something goes wrong. Uh, and, and we've basically come to treat war as a spectator sport, uh, in which the players are professionals. Um, you were one. Uh, and, uh, you know, thank you for that. But I think um, the fact that there's no political um, check on presidential power to order bombing raids and, and send troops all over the place uh, is one reason we've had so many foolish uh, fights with them. Yeah. And, and I would say that the lacking the full commitment of the American public maybe has something to do with why we haven't done so well in these fights. Certainly, certainly a, a major factor on that. And then pulling all that stuff up to, to, to where we are today, certainly, and, and let's start for the moment in the, the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, but definitely not going to be the only place we talk about because there has been such a move, not just this one by Macron that we talked about a second ago, but certainly by a whole host of American figures and definitely President Biden. And, you know, we must win Ukraine. I'm sorry, Russia must lose. That's usually the priority. And Ukraine must win, even though that the, the battlefield realities don't support that. And yet there's just this maniacal desire. And Gary, I think we have this one up. If you could pull it up, the one, the, the February 20th one from Biden, which is basically a commercial going back to the uh the commercial uh, the uh military industrial complex and how it's a business i mean this literally seems like a commercial for war watch this we have to stand up to putin and pass the national bipartisan bill the national security bill supporting ukraine as they defend themselves against putin's vicious onslaught and prove to the world once more america can be relied on we stand strong with our allies we have to remember who we are we're the united states of america we keep our commitments. We never walk away from our friends. And we sure as hell don't bow down to Vladimir Putin. So you see, his focus here is exclusively on the financial issues of, of providing weapons for Ukraine, all the money that, that that goes into. There is zero talk, not even not even on the side of, hey, let's see if we can find a diplomatic way out of this and end the war at a lower cost that will preserve anything. I mean, that's not even on the table. It's just more cash. And with that kind of environment, how do you avoid a, a Cold War 2.0? Well, um, we are in a new era of struggle in which rather than being the center of the centerpiece of a broad alliance committed to the objectives that we've established, uh, we are pretty isolated. I mean, Europe, um, for the most part, uh, is pretty panicked about Ukraine, concerned about the possibility that we will uh, default on this uh, struggle that we threw them into. Uh, Ukraine um, has no path to victory at this point. Um, and I just, uh, I'm in the process of looking at uh, our contest with China from uh, the point of view of what's actually happened as opposed to happening as opposed to what's being said. You know, we have all this strong rhetoric about how we're gonna compete with innovation and so forth. Do you realize that our budget for National Science Foundation gets a 8.3% cut? The National Institute of Science and Technology gets a 12% cut in the current budget. NASA's uh, science programs get a 5.9% cut. I mean, we, we have very strong rhetoric but it's totally at odds with reality and with what we're doing. And I think the same thing is true with Ukraine, unfortunately. And I think, you know, we do need to think about it. They're all very well to say, well, we're going to win. Um, you know, that's what they say in the locker room at halftime, uh, if you're behind. Um, but in the end, uh, that's probably not what's going to happen. 
And we need to think about what happens if we lose. Right. Um, and that's what there doesn't seem to be. Any. If, we, if, we, if we press too hard on the Russians, we could lose big time, like some of our cities. Right. We, we actually had a show on earlier today where we talked about the, the, the real possibility that if we continue to press in these areas, that uh, the threshold for Russia to use a tactical nuclear weapon is much lower than what we would and lower than many people think, because you have people like Ben Hodges who continually dismiss that and say, oh, that's just bluster. He doesn't really mean that. Not paying any attention to the fact that it's actually in Russian doctrine about, you know, the escalate to de-escalate and the use of tactical nuclear weapons, which he should know as a general, because they did a lot of the exercises while he was in the U.S. Your Army Europe. But that's an issue we'll talk for another day. But the real yeah, question I, is, I, I'm sorry. If I may, I just, just uh, uh, say I don't agree that the issue is tactical nuclear weapons. I think it's strategic use of nuclear weapons. There's nothing in Ukraine that requires Russia to use a nuclear weapon unless Mr. Macron puts French troops in there, in which case he might. But short of that, what we're talking about is a strategic use of nuclear force against us, because this is our war. Uh, it's not Mr. Macron's, whatever, uh, however number of uh, French Foreign Legion or other mercenaries may be on the ground in Ukraine. This is the U.S. against Russia in a proxy war. And the Russians have been very clear from the beginning they want to negotiate with the United States. And we've been very clear, we won't negotiate. And they've been very clear that if you won't negotiate, they will use force. I think this is all very dangerous. And I don't agree that tactical nuclear weapons are the issue. I think that's an evasion of the possibility that the proxy war could become direct. Well, I think I think the the idea, or the, at least it was discussed earlier on our show, was that the like the entry level would be a tactical nuclear weapon, which could then expand into theater ballistic nuclear weapons, which then everything is off the table. But are you suggesting you think there's a your risk that they could bypass the tactical and go straight to a theater? Absolutely. I'm, I look at Russian nuclear doctrine, and the, and and that is absolutely the case. <clears throat> you know, a little more alarming. So I, I think, I think we should be more alarmed than, you know, this is this is the typical. I'm sorry to say, typical American evasion. You know, the war is going to happen over there. It's not going to happen here. Uh, we'll keep it in Asia. We'll keep it in Europe. It won't affect us. We can all go to the Mall of America and stock up on, you know, the latest cheap Chinese clothing imports. Um, uh, this is not realistic. Uh, you know, one of the one of the prerequisites <laughs> to be able to avoid any of those kinds of uh, outcomes is to have communication between the countries uh, and to have the level of trust. And, and I think that that is uh, demonstrably deteriorated to the point to where it may not even exist. And I'm going to show uh, a clip here from 2013 where President Clinton was talking about his time in office and how he had what the relationship he had with Putin, which I think was probably something healthy. Mr. Putin has got, he got all, he's very smart. Well, you know him better than most people. Yeah, I do. What was he like behind closed doors away from, you know, the sort of the public utterances? Smart and um, remarkably, um, we had a really good blunt relationship. How blunt? Brutally blunt. Ever but, like in a fisticuff? No, no, but I think, you know, I think the right strategy most of the time is, but it's frustrating to people in your line of work. You should be brutally honest with people in private. And then if you want them to help you, try to avoid embarrassing them in public. Right. And Did Putin ever renege on a personal no, agreement he made to you? he did not. So behind closed doors, he could be trusted. He kept his word in all the deals we made. Now, whether he could trust us was a separate matter, but we had Doug on here a couple of days ago, Doug McGregor. Uh, in his view, we have destroyed what even existed back then. If the Russians see the Western nations doing this, putting all this money in killing their troops, I mean, at some point they're going to say, it's stupid for us not to get ready for that outcome. And of course, then if you have this mutually building fear of each other, and that's what leads to a lot of wars. And so we're going down a path right now that our foolish actions here could lead us into catastrophe.
No, I think so. But I also think Mr. Putin is a rational man. He's never wanted any of this. He really wants to get back to some sort of state of normalcy with the West and do business. But as you say, he has to respond to what he sees develop. Right now, we have Americans moving in to create bases in northern Finland and Sweden. We've destroyed decades of trust and mutual confidence, replaced all of it with mutual suspicion, fear, and distrust. Now, how, how would you, like, especially as someone who did a lot behind the scenes for decades in this country, how would you assess where it was and where it is? Well, I think we did build a great deal of mutual confidence in our relationship with Moscow after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, and um, we did it out of a well-founded fear on both sides that if we didn't do it, uh, we would not be able to manage the relationship. Uh, since the end of the Cold War, uh, we've repeatedly broken our word with the Russians. We broke it on NATO enlargement. You know, you can say, well, they, we, they didn't get it in writing, but you know, honorable people don't need to put things in writing. If they give their word, they keep it. Uh, and uh, we broke that word. We've withdrawn from treaties, the INF Treaty in Europe, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. We've withdrawn, we withdrew earlier from the uh, anti-ballistic missile treaty. Uh, we have ignored various understandings that we had on how to manage relations with great powers. We did a deal with Iran uh, on nuclear uh, programs, and then we backed away from it, uh, even though it had been anchored in the Security Council resolution and it was part of international law. So we have a record of just doing what, what we feel like, regardless of whether we've given our word or not. Um, uh, at the moment, we don't have any substantial dialogue at all with the Russians, or for that matter, much of uh, with the Chinese, <coughs> none with Iran. Um, so um, I think uh, Doug McGregor is absolutely correct. It's and of course, that was that was echoed a couple of days ago by Putin, who in one of his uh, interviews on television, he expressly said that there there is no trust and he doesn't trust anything in the West, which would imply that the threshold for a, any kind of negotiated settlement is going to be higher than it should have been. Uh, and as you and I have talked before, there was plenty of opportunities earlier in the war, which we catapulted and destroyed all of them. And now that we're all where we are here. But now I, I want to show you one more thing uh, here. And this was a uh, Jordan Peterson earlier in the war, uh, which apparently you're going to say he understated the, the level of risk. But even what he says here is pretty alarming. Do you think he will down. use a nuclear weapon? If necessary, he'll use a tactical battlefield weapon. Even yes. if it starts World War Three, It won't. Probably. Why? Because we wouldn't respond? What's in it for us? If you let him do it and get away with it, where does that end? Then you are into a hit well, analogy. Well, there's a lot. You can get yourself in a situation, no problem, where there's no good outcome. Mm. We, we're trying to do that right now on every front we can possibly imagine. Mm. We can easily get ourselves in a situation where it's hell this way and hell that way. That we're, That's highly probable. Naive notions that the Russians are going to lose somehow or that we're going to win. I, I don't, I just don't understand. I don't understand that. Well, what do you mean we're going to win? What are we going to win here exactly? So the, the, the issue being that we want Russia to lose and we want our side to win, but that is detached from, from reality here. And do you see any, any off ramp given, given who's in control of all the, the levers of power here, whether it's Macron or Biden or, or any of these other folks in NATO, is there an off ramp or where do you see this heading? Maybe is a better question. Well, it depends on how you frame the question. If the question is, can you protect Ukraine from being totally destroyed? Then the answer is there has to be a change of government in Kyiv or a fundamental change of policy. Can't go on saying we won't negotiate, we'll, you know, and, and so forth. And I don't think the United States saying we're prepared to fight to the last drop of blood, meaning Ukrainian blood, not ours, is very persuasive. Um, and I don't, as I said earlier, I don't, I don't see any circumstance arising in Ukraine under current circumstances where Russia is basically winning, where it would choose to use a tactical nuclear weapon. Um, if we escalate against Russia, as we appear to be doing, yeah, uh, then I think we raise a question of their escalating against us, not against Ukraine. 
you know, what we're doing now, what this discussion between the German generals behind the back of Defense Minister Pistorius, what Macron's talking about, uh, what some British uh, thinkers are talking about, uh, is deep strikes into Russia proper. Some of them are happening. You think they're going to just sit there and do nothing? I don't believe that. I believe they will retaliate. So far, they have retaliated mainly against infrastructure and industrial facilities in Ukraine. But at some point, they have to recognize that the shots are being called in Washington, not in Kyiv. Uh, that, you know, it, it, we are encouraging the Ukrainians. We are supplying the weaponry to the, I mean, the collective West. To, we're supplying the weaponry to the Ukrainians they're using to attack Russia proper. Uh, so this isn't the limited war that it was, yeah. you know, until quite recently. And that, so that you, is you really quite some of these weapons were the, some of the long range weapons, which have already been provided. If Ukraine at some point uses them to strike something significant inside Russia proper, do you think <laughs> that there's a risk that they would finally say, OK, you because Putin in, in light of his comment yesterday or day before where he said, OK, you don't have red lines, then neither am I that he may change instead of doing some of the things you've decided to that's actually right. launch into the West. Do you think that's a possibility? That's, that's right. It's absolutely a possibility. Um, you know, I mean, we, I go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis. We came in within a hair's breadth of a nuclear exchange. Uh, it was a game of chicken on both sides. Fortunately, John Kennedy, the president, had the wit without telling anybody to compromise. He traded our missiles in Turkey, mm -hmm. which were the precipitate cause of Khrushchev's sending missiles to Cuba uh, for the missiles in Cuba. And both sides blinked in the end. You can't count on that. I think, you know, all of us have been in situations as, as as Peterson was saying, you know, um, you can get yourself into a situation where you, you can't move forward or backwards. You have no way out. Um, we seem to be trying to get ourselves into a situation where, as you put it, there's no off ramp. You know, why do we do this? We, Ukraine is not gaining anything by its continued continuation of this fight or its escalation of it. Uh, it. All it is doing is giving up bargaining position. It's losing ground. Right, right. And, in, and if you won't get it, when we finally do get into a negotiation, because we will at some point, um, we will if President Trump is back, we will if we have some common sense in Washington before that, yeah. Uh, we'll get into a negotiation and it's kind of the settlement of the negotiation is going to be on Russian terms yeah. because the Russians have done on the ground what they needed to do to have the upper hand. Ukraine could have had a far better deal at various points yes. than it is ever going to get. Uh, so why, why are we uh, adamant that you know, we have to make Russia lose? Um, you know, uh, if Russia loses badly enough, which I don't think is going to happen, Russia's nuclear doctrine says it will lash out. Of course, yeah. I, I mean, there's there is no scenario, in my view, none, where Russia could be, even if some miracle you did somehow change the battlefield calculus and they started being driven out of the areas where they have annexed into their country, that they would allow that to happen and not go nuclear. I, I don't see any chance of that. And as and I agree with you up to this point their conventional power has been such that it's unnecessary to use any tactical uh, nuclear weapons up to this point. But if things change, I think fighting, it's troubling. They've been fighting a limited war. Um, they have been restrained. They could have uh, committed a much greater force to Ukraine. They could um, talk about conquering Ukraine. They're not talking about that. They're talking about the Romanians and Poles taking part of Ukraine. You know, because uh, those parts part. of what is now Ukraine were once part of uh, I mean, the Soviet Union, gave those to Ukraine after World War II. Um, so 
he's not talking about taking all of Ukraine or invading Western Europe or conquering the world or anything else. And, uh, you know, why would you push him into a corner? Uh, even a cornered rat will fight. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think this is, uh, there's no strategy here. It's just well, a sort of problem, yeah. impulse. How, so, what's the war termination strategy? And we say we're going to, you know, defeat Russia. Russia's going to lose. How do we do that? What is the termination strategy? At what point, in what forum, in what way does Russia cry uncle? I don't think we have any idea. Without, right. And, yeah. And so this is, a again, from my problem with this war from the very beginning has been the same problem I've had with a number of other American wars. You shouldn't start a war without knowing what your end state, desired end state, is going to be. You shouldn't move the goalposts in the middle of the war in response to success. You should have a war termination strategy. You've got to figure out how it's going to end, why the enemy should prefer to end it rather than continue or escalate it. Hey, and then to know whether you have the resources to accomplish that goal, which that we don't even make well, those course. calculations. And that's where the, the, these cuts in the science and technology budgets come in. We talk a good game. We won't put the resources into the game that we propose to play. Strong rhetoric is not a substitute for strong action. And, and let me let me ask you this question here in the, the remaining time we have here, because it seems to me there's there's basically two ways this could go right now. It could go either into a Cold War II, 2.0, especially in, in uh, Europe, or it could go into a World War III if it escalates beyond those areas we have here. Or do you see some third way? Because I don't see, I think it's either one or the other right now. I don't see a good way to end. And which do you think of those two is the most likely? If you had to make the call right now, what do you think? Well, we're very nostalgic about the Cold War. We imagine that the current situation is a contest between democracy and autocracy, replicating the Cold War. It really was back then. We imagine it's great power rivalry, the geopolitical element. But as we say that, we're watching middle-ranking powers, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, others, Japan, uh, Indonesia, move off uh, the great power rivalry uh, platform and seize opportunities to declare their independence from their former patrons. So um, I, I think we've got it wrong. I think we're trying to replicate the book Cold War. It's like we're a one-trick pony. The only thing we know how to do is containment, sanctions, and the Cold War. But this is not the situation we're in. That is not where the world is going. And this war, Ukraine war, is not supported by the vast majority of the world's population and governments who want to stay out of it. They see it as not their fight. And we've seen they don't approve of Russia's violation of international law by invading Ukraine. They disapprove, but that doesn't make them feel they have to support us or that we have no responsibility for starting this war. And the same thing is even worse uh, with our support of genocide in Gaza. That has cost us the last shred of our moral authority. If this is a, indeed, if this were a contest between great, uh, great in, in the context of great power rivalry, we don't have the support we did in the Cold War. If there is a general breakdown of relationships between the great powers of the world, including Russia, China, India, ourselves, Europe, if it ever gets its act together, um, then uh, we're gonna be isolated. I mean, we're, we've decided we're gonna trash the world order that we created after World War II, which was a pretty good one, yeah. uh, in favor of, of foolish adventures against Russia and uh, absolutely amoral, not to say immoral, support of genocide by Israel. So, um, so the, given, the leaders, choice, given the leaders that we have and the, those who were in the, on the bench, uh, where do you see this going? Which way is it going to go? Well, apparently, there, you know, there is no bench. Um, there is a personality cult in the Republican Party build around one man. He doesn't have a succession plan. Um, Biden doesn't have a select succession plan either. We've got a contest between two old men with old ideas 
and no proven competence. Um, you know, you can be happy about that. My sense is that very few people are. Uh, maybe some true believers on both sides. Uh, where is the vision that we used to have of a better country, a better world, um, our leading in that direction? Where is that? I don't see it. Well, that's that's uh, troubling. And in fact, the uh, last thing I want to ask you about here uh, is going to just put a little bit more darkness on that, the kind of a coda here. Uh, Although in a certain sense, it may be a slightly positive uptick. There has been a surprising development uh, from at least from Senator Chuck Schumer, uh, who has now, I don't know, found a voice of, of, of dis dispute with the White House. Uh, here's one of the things he said recently. The four major obstacles are Hamas and the Palestinians who support and tolerate their evil ways. Radical right wing Israelis in government and society. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. So, you know, I see that, what do you I, think about that? I, I see that in, frankly, quite cynically. Um, I think this is trying to scapegoat Netanyahu. Netanyahu created a lot of the conditions that now prevail in Israel. But if you get rid of him, those conditions are not going to go away. So this is, you know, like the ship is on course to go up uh, on the rocks. So let's throw the captain to the sharks, but don't change course. I mean, that's how I see this. I think this was politically expedient on Mr. Schumer's part. Uh, I don't find it persuasive. Uh, I don't think it's the break with Israeli policy that we need. Uh, what it is is personalizing it uh, in a way that allows you to do something that looks as though you're doing something, but you aren't doing anything. It, it doesn't seem likely that he would say something with, because I know he's very uh, closely connected with the white house. Uh, is there any chance that, that the white house may, he wanted him to do that to give Biden some room to maybe make some changes or, or is that any, is, is they going to keep going forward there as well? Well, it is uh, a further reaction by uh, a prominent Democrat uh, to the phenomenon of the withdrawal of enthusiasm for Biden's candidacy. And the move away from de dem the Democratic Party by young people uh, all over the country. I mean, we've seen people talk about the Michigan uh, uncommitted vote. Frankly, in other primaries since then, there've been a, there's been a huge uncommitted vote. Yeah, there's 20% in Minnesota as well. Yeah. so. So this is a reaction to that. Um, I would say Mr. Schumer doesn't do anything without checking with APAC. And uh, so uh, he's closer to APAC than he is to Joe Biden. Uh, Joe Biden's pretty close to APAC, too. Uh, so, so, so I almost I, feel I almost feel odd, is, to, I almost feel odd this, to ask the question in light of all the things we talked about with the Russia-Ukraine. But given the same people are on the leadership councils here, is there anything that be, can can be done? And what would you advise the White House to do right now with all the mess that has happened to change course so the ship doesn't hit the rocks? What would you recommend? I think the answer is clear. And that is don't try to pull gimmicks like airdrops and a two month off pier offshore Gaza. I mean, by the way, there was a port there that the Israelis destroyed. They also destroyed the airport in Gaza. Um, this is, you know, with the right hand, we're pumping weapons into Israel to kill Palestinians. With the left hand, we're promising some way down the road, we'll get some food in. Um, this is the craziest, inco most incoherent policy you can possibly imagine. Cut the Gordian knot. Stop the supplies to Israel for this war. They won't respond to requests. They need to respond to a decisive action by the president, and I would hope Mr. Schumer, for once, would support the president in confronting Israel. Well, that's uh, that certainly would would make some changes. But uh, and that's one of the things we've actually been arguing for here a lot on our channel. And, uh, you know, I don't see any any evidence that it's going to happen. And I, I fear that the ship is just going to keep going until it hits a rock. And that can take so many different 
more forms and we just don't know, but I think they're all end up bad, both for the Palestinian people, for the United States, and even for the people in Israel. I think that they're all going to come out losers on this, I'm afraid. If we go up on the rocks, we will have done so by choice. There are alternatives. If we don't have the courage to pursue them, then that says something about us and that I don't like to hear. But I I suspect you may be right. Yeah, couldn't agree with you more than that. Uh, Well, listen, uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for coming back on the show again and providing some real clarity uh, to both of these issues going on in both the, the Europe and as well as in the Middle East. Uh, honestly, I mean, I think it's truthful. A lot of things are hard in life. Some things aren't. Some things that there is a clear path, even if they're ugly and hard and unpleasant, but they're not difficult to figure out. You, The direction is the right answer. Uh, but to, to ignore that and to continue on is, as you uh, eloquently said, to, to drive the ship into the rocks when there is a course correction available in the bridge. You know, in the land of the marshmallows, the skewer is king. And this is the moment to skewer this problem. Not, you know, biting the marshmallow isn't going to do it. Uh, So uh, I think we just need to be honest with ourselves and we need to be tough minded and we need to put America first. Yes, honest and tough minded and do what makes sense for our country which is odd that it has to be said out loud because it seems so often that, that we're doing other anything besides that. And definitely this case in Ukraine is a, a chief a- evidence of that as well as uh, Israel here. But uh, we thank you for coming on today and we thank you guys for joining us. Uh, we remain unintimidated and uncompromised. We are going to give you the truth no matter what it is. Uh, and you can count on us to keep doing that. Thanks very much. We ask you to like and subscribe uh, and to share with your friends. And we will look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.